The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Once a family arrives, they can enjoy all the amenities that the park has to offer without ever getting back in their vehicle. If you're hunting with another person, be very careful to never cross into that person's safe zone of fire. I don't really get nervous, but my adrenaline does get pumping. These fascinate me. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. We are at Fort Parker State Park. We are located between the cities of Mahia and Grosbeck in Limestone County. It's so open, but yet there's so many trees and shade and it's so quiet. Everything is just so close and handy. Campsites are real close to the hiking trails and they're also real close to the swim area. Ta-da! The places to fish, to ride their bikes. Mama, look at this one. Oh wow, is it soft? I think that's a rabbit. Once a family arrives, they can enjoy all the amenities that the park has to offer without ever getting back in their vehicle. Native Americans were drawn to this site by the natural springs that still flow into the Navasota River. Anglo settlers, also drawn by the water, established the town of Springfield here in 1838. The population at that time period was more than Dallas and Houston's population put together. When the railroad bypassed Springfield in the 1870s, the town began to fade away. Today, the only thing that remains of this once bustling community is the historic Springfield Cemetery, located within the park. The first and largest slave owner of Limestone County is buried there. But there are also freed slaves buried in that same cemetery. This was a very unique thing to happen here. See, my dad is buried over there. That was the only cemetery that is integrated from the beginning. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, the Civilian Conservation Corps was established to provide jobs for unemployed young men. The people of the surrounding communities actually petitioned the government to get a CCC camp out here to make a recreational park. The number of the CCC camp was 3807C, and the C stood for colored. Life in the camp was, you know, I would say it was beautiful. When you was out there at, working on that swamp, you didn't know where your next meal was coming from. But when you didn't CC camp, you knew where you were going to get the three hearts a day. The CCC not only built the dam that backed up the Navasota River to form uh, Fort Parker Lake, they also built the recreation hall, they constructed the roads, they built picnic tables. The CCC just did a fantastic job here. They were proud of what they had done, and uh, rightfully so. Well, I found a mushroom. Does that count? Where? The Burr Oak Nature oh, yeah. Trail is just an ideal length trail for families with young children. Turk's cap. It's oh, also oh, marked oh, with oh, plant oh, identification oh, markers. The bright red flowers attract butterflies and hummingbirds. It's a fairly hot day, Look. but the trail is completely shaded, so it's easy to do. <laughs> That's got to be the big Burr Oak. The kids enjoyed it, and we're going to go swimming now because the swimming hole's right next to the trailhead. Yay! 
Trails here offer a lot of variety for different styles of riding, whether you are a seasoned rider or you're here with your family. It just kind of offers a nice flow. You're going to have some descent and ascent. Along with that, you do have some twists and turns, some rocks and roots, which makes it a little bit more exciting for those that are a little more seasoned. This is where we come to ride a lot. This is home away from home for sure. We're on the Navasota River at Fort Parker State Park. In this river, the crappie is probably the most sought after game fish. I go for these bass. There's some good sized fish in here. He's about wore out. The biggest one I've caught out of here is nine pounds and 13 ounces. Well, that's a keeper. But the biggest one that's been caught is 12 pounds and two ounces. Here's another one. It's good enough to where I keep coming back three times a week. That's a typical Fort Parker black bass. Didn't get skunked. Canoeing and kayaking is very popular because not only can they canoe and kayak the lake, they also have the Navasota River that they can kayak. And that hosts a whole other world of wildlife that they get to see when they're going up and down the river. Like that little slide there. You can come out here and just have a really fun time relaxing and spending time with your family, making memories that will last a lifetime in a very relaxed atmosphere. The one thing that I love about Fort Parker State Park is the serenity. Being able to look across the water, watch the sunsets, watch the birds fly across, it does something good for the soul. Visiting Texas State Parks just got easier. With our new online reservation features, you can choose a specific cabin, campsite, or shelter and reserve it for your next visit. The new reservation system makes it easier to plan group getaways. Save the day and don't get turned away with our optional day use reservation. Good morning. And be sure to get in. Thank you. Plus, you can buy park passes and gift cards online. Yeah. Texas State Parks, getting better for you. Hi, I'm Heidi Rayo, Hunter Education Specialist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Let's talk about safe zones of fire while hunting. When hunting in a group, each hunter has a safe zone of fire. This is an area where you can safely take a shot. If you shoot beyond your safe zone of fire, this could have dangerous or deadly results. It's easy to find your safe zone of fire. Start by focusing on an object ahead of you like a tree. Hold your thumbs up and slowly bring them to the side of your body until your thumbs disappear out of vision. This is about a 45 degree angle and the area where you can safely take a shot. This is your safe zone of fire. It's that easy. If you're hunting with another person, be very careful to never cross into that person's safe zone of fire. In fact, no matter how many hunters there are, even one hunter, you should never swing outside of your 45 degree safe zone of fire. Another thing to think about is target fixation. When a bird flushes, you can easily forget about your surroundings and your safe zone of fire. If you're excited and only focusing on your target, you can quickly lose track of your safe shooting zone. You can even lose sight of buildings and roadways. This is very dangerous. Bottom line, don't let target fixation override your sense of safety. Firearm safety is your responsibility, so always be aware of your safe zone of fire, even when you're excited. We always want to enjoy safe and memorable hunts.
This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. Like this one's pollinated, but this one is. Thank you. There's a bee one. If you find bees in your backyard, you should count yourself lucky because all of our plants in Texas require pollination. Some are pollinated through wind, but many are pollinated by our native bees, honeybees, wasps, butterflies, and other pollinators. However, if you do find a hive that's in a place that's not appropriate, maybe it's in an area that you need to mow or it's too close to the house, you do have an option. You don't have to actually exterminate those hives. My name is Whitney Nolan. We're in Austin, Texas at my home, and I'm having uh, some bees removed from my house. So here's the back where I have my goat pen tied into my shed. Oh, man and my chicken coop that I built on the end of the goat pen. Back here is the tree where I've got my main hive. And you can tell she's, uh, she's blaring. <laughs> she's full. She's like a full tummy. Yeah, that's a beautiful hive. It's awesome. A few years back, I installed two owl houses, uh, one in the front yard and one in the backyard. And I had screech owls that inhabited both boxes for about two years. <laughs> Then after that, bees started taking over the box in the back. One year, uh, the hive was so big, they broke off and they swarmed and they inhabited the front owl house. And now I have bees in the front owl house. The tree is weaker now. I'm thinking about having the front one removed. I want it to be safe in the neighborhood and also if I ever need to do anything with that tree, I want the bees to be safe. I'm gonna light it, put it in the bottom. Get the smoker going. My name is Peyton Price. I'm a bee specialist with the American Honey Bee Protection Agency. Even if it's a small hive or you're not doing much, it's always good to have smoke for safety concerns. Keep the bees a little more docile, move them where I want to. We're at a client's house. She has a hive and an owl box in her front yard and a tree. We are removing it today. We're gonna take it out to one of our apiaries and give it a new home. I don't really get nervous, but my adrenaline does get pumping. Bees fascinate me. This is a perfect bee home. First thing I'm gonna do is smoke them a little bit. A little smoke, I can get them kind of go back into the hive to the back. They've got some escape holes on the bottom I'm gonna seal. Now I won't smash any bees when I set that box down. So we got a couple of the guard bees coming out front. I can smell their pheromones on me. It kind of smells like bananas. All right, I got it all taped up. They all retreated back into the hive. I'm gonna dislodge this bottom nail. Oh, we almost got this one out. There we go, it's free. So the top nail's about to come out. Try not to break the back of the box off. And we are free. So I've got the hive down. I'm just gonna set these ladies here for now. So I'm just setting them over here in this area so they have a place to regroup over the next couple of days. If I was to take this hive right now, I would not get to take all of the forager bees with the hive itself. They would stay here, they'd either die or uh, very unlikely find another colony. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave this box here until uh, either the sun goes down or before the sun comes up another day when all the forager bees come back to the original hive and then I will take them all at once to the new location, their new home. Oh man, this is beautiful, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what do we have here, Peyton? Yeah, here we are, we're at our, one of our newest co-ops. Right on. First of all, in the state of Texas, if you have five acres or more, you can get an agricultural exemption for allowing us to bring bees there. You uh, removed a beehive earlier. Yeah, let's check it out. See how they've taken their new box. Oh, that's a nice hive. We come out and we place the bees that we catch that are feral and we bring them to the property and we care for them and uh, they produce honey and wax, propolis, things like that that we harvest. See, so you see in this one, you see the, the syrup that they're bringing in. Those look good. 
this is a really good thing. Way to go, Peyton. We'll, we'll come back in a couple weeks. Texas has a wonderful variety of bees. As you're out walking around in nature, take a look at some of the bees that are pollinating flowers around Texas. When they're full of honey, for the most part, what we really encourage people to do is understand what bees are doing, what wasps are doing when they're out in the environment, and where they can be tolerated, and when they might need to be relocated. It's sunrise on Chocolate Bayou in West Galveston Bay. Brian Treadway. Oh. Mm, that was money right there. And Robert Good focus their fishing efforts on flounder. Chocolate Bayou is an uh, is excellent spot for flounder. It's really, we have one of the shallowest bays in all the coast. And, and really and truly, we have the absolute best place to fish in the world right in our own backyard. I think I've got a hit. Fish on, fish on. And it doesn't take long before Brian catches the first flounder of the day. I give you the southern flounder. Lived to be about six years of age. And you can get up to 10 pounds. The state record's 13 pounds. So a 20 inch flounder is considered a trophy fish. their flattened shape, and uncanny ability to change colors to match their surroundings makes the flounder nearly invisible. Found throughout Texas bays and in the Gulf, where they spawn in winter, they prefer shallow mud or sandy bottoms. The edge of the shoreline is a prime example of what you want to fish. It's not flat. It's Simply curvy and lots of points, lots of edges, drains that are coming out of the marsh. It's just a prime example of great, great terrain for the flounder. There's a fish. Ooh, got one. There he is. Bambino. Got a juvenile, about 10, 12 inches long. Yeah, they got. They have extremely, extremely sharp teeth. That's their main weapon, baby southern flounder. Once night falls on Texas bays. See anything, Co? Not right now. Folks have a different way of going after flounder. Co Parker and his dad, Kelly, shine their lights in Christmas Bay. Oh, shoot. Stepped on him. Stepped on him. I missed him. Let me see if I can find another one real quick. I saw a few over here. With lights and a little luck, the Parkers are looking to gig some flounder. The tools you need for gigging are uh, a good gig, two-prong preferably. Um, I have mine marked off with uh, the legal size limit. Um, you have an underwater gig light along with a 12-volt uh, uh, deer feeder battery. And that's pretty much all you need. It's gotten clear up here, but I'm, it's awful shallow, too. Typically, I do this in the summertime. And so late in the evening, it's nice and cool. I'm not worried about a sunburn, so it's relaxing. You aren't working up a sweat. And it's, just, it's just very enjoyable, very peaceful. And for the Parkers, patience and a keen eye pay off. Hurry, 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 hurry before it goes. The cloud's going to get over. Go. Yeah, there you go. That actually looks like a gold flounder. I knew there was one hiding out here somewhere. Yeah, they're very hard to find. And a lot of people, first time gigging, ask what they're looking for. And literally, you're looking for what we call the imprint. It's the outline of the flounder. So it looks like a football with a tail. That's how I kind of describe it to new people that are coming out to the sport. Sampling surveys throughout Texas bays got a few nice reds coming. show that the other two popular sport fish, spotted sea trout 
and redfish are doing fairly well. 493. But those surveys do indicate a decline in the numbers of southern flounder. Pretty. We've had a slow but steady decrease in flounder population throughout the coast of Texas. There's been worse in some bays than it has in others, but it's just been a slow decline. Data suggests a lower number of females, overfishing, and loss due to shrimp bycatch are some of the main problems. So now, Coastal Fish Hatchery's newest challenge is to boost the southern flounder population. The whole point of the stock enhancement program is to be able to supplement the natural population with fish. There come some eggs. Flounder are totally different from redfish and trout. It's a whole new ball game. So we're at the beginning stages of uh, learning how to culture this fish. One of the problems for Shane and the stocking team is they need more of these male brooders to fertilize the females. They're almost always next to these reefs. Using nets, the stocking team is on the lookout. A little bit deeper here. You have so many factors that can go against you, whether it's the wind or a strong tide. And then, of course, visibility is not optimal. I try to look for a triangle because, like, it's the eyes and the nose. They kind of form like a little, little bitty point that I'm looking for. And it doesn't take long before the action heats up. Oh! I'm going to guide the boat to it. Hard down. There you go. Did I get him? But I think you got him. Hmm. That's a nice fish. I was nervous. I always think I got them until they swim off. <laughs> Bring that little fellow in here. <laughs> that is a good sized male. Go ahead. Got him. The team needs several males alive and well. When you come out here and catch one of these guys and put your hands on them and know that you're going to take these back to the hatchery and uh, they're potentially going to produce thousands and thousands of fingerlings. You can't explain it, you can't put a price on it. So we're very happy to, to be able to do this and, and be productive at doing it. Nice work. There's a little bit of uh, milk coming out. It's just that cloudy, uh, whitish looking substance. With more brooders back at the hatchery, they are able to produce thousands of small flounder larvae. After three months, it's time to help boost the wild population with these hatchery-raised flounder. What we're going to do is release some of these fingerlings into this nice estuarine habitat. We've got a really good incoming tide and really good shoreline with a lot of grass, a lot of cover and protection for these fish. If we're able to stock fish into areas that are needed, then that is just another additional tool that can help the population recover. It's a beautiful thing. Caught a lot of fish over the years. Get it. For Brian and Robert, the thrill of catching <laughs> flounder keeps them fishing all day, all year long. What a nice one. And hopefully for all anglers, these fish will be plentiful again. The way they're shaped, they're really flat and goes from just being nothing and then it's like a bass. I think that flounder's on a huge upswing and they're starting to let them go. I mean, they let a ton go last year uh, in places that needed it. You know, if they can do it with a trout and redfish, then hopefully they can do it with a flounder.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.